Hi, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to tonight's uh, panel discussion. We've got an exciting topic today. I think we're going to go through some challenges and some opportunities and things like that. But I just do like to thank our sponsors, KMS for our city, Digital Reunion, and Stepping Stones Recruitment for making these events happen. So they happen every month. Um, check it out on the Enterprise Plan. You know, our website, and please do sign up and keep attending. We'd like to see female participation in these events. So I'll hand it over to Chantel to take the lead on tonight's discussion. Thank you very much, Caitlin. Um, Caitlin and I have known each other forever because we went to school together. Um, typical Cayman story. Um, and no one here is unfamiliar to me either, particularly uh, this person to my left. Um, Danielle is very well known in the tech space in Cayman, very well known in the blockchain and fintech space in Cayman. And we also have Emily joining us from Dublin at a very unsociable hour, so we're, <laughs> we're very grateful for her attendance. Um, we are missing one participant. We had Hallie who was coming from the UK and um, because the event got rescheduled, this clashed with her flights and it was delayed BA as it recently has been recent, like all the time. Um, so ha Hallie's unfortunately not been able to make it. So I might throw a question out to any graduates or students in the crowd towards the end for their insights um, because Hallie's a recent graduate. Um, but for now, uh, just a little background on me. I'm a partner at a law firm in Cayman called Collis Krill. I work in the investment funds, corporate, and regulatory space, which has naturally segued me into the fintech space as well. Danielle has been, in particular, um, integral in my knowledge and um, skill up in that space. And I know a lot of you from Tech Talk events and Cayman Enterprise City does a great job there. And now I'll hand over to Emily to introduce herself and then Danielle. Thank you. I'm delighted to be able to participate today, even if virtually. Um, I am based in Dublin at the moment, so I've been working in recruitment for just over six years. I pretty quickly decided that I wanted to specialize in tech recruitment and really the bulk of my experience has been with engineering, construction and project management, initially in the biotech sector, but then more recently it shifted towards other areas of tech like digital assets and cybersecurity. Um, I have recruited across a number of markets, so Europe, UK and currently the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, I'll be moving over to Cayman myself in about four or five weeks. So hopefully for the next talk, I'll be there in person as well. Perfect. So, I mean, most of you know my face as well, <laughs> just like the rest of the panel. Um, I'm a director on crypto and Web3 structures and foundations, funds, FASPs, <laughs> you name it, we will consider it. <laughs> um, I've probably been in the space now for almost seven years, you know, um, started trading and then worked in several other industries as well and now sitting as a full-time director on some of the projects that we're on. Excellent. So we're here to discuss women and representation of females in the tech space. Uh, so the first question I'm going to ask the panelists are, what trends have you observed in gender diversity in the tech space? Emily, do you want to go? <laughs> yes, I will start off, absolutely. Um, so I think some of the trends I've noticed is there is a clear distinction between the roles that women tend to shift towards versus men in tech. So with women, they tend to go towards like user design and experience, quality assurance, um, product management. And then with men, they tend to be more in software engineering or hardware, electronic engineering. So I don't know if that's to do with maybe the courses that they decide to choose in college, whereas women like to do interdisciplinary studies um, or even the options that they're presented with early on in school. I do think that with young boys, they're encouraged to pursue careers in tech and engineering and they've got more access and just exposure to those areas versus the curriculum that might be offered in all female schools. So that's one of the most important trends that I have noticed and maybe what might be causing the kind of underrepresentation of women in tech at the moment. So if we're just talking trends here, I mean, there's, there's loads of trends. So I've done a little bit of research on this as well. And um, we've been in a couple of, you know, different conversations about this and trends. So there's a couple of Deloitte, for instance, um, that are research on women in tech and specifically 
crypto. And I think it increased um, significantly over the last couple of, of years. Their statistic was more or less 30% of the industry is women. And then only 17% of that 30% is actually women in senior roles. So that's an entirely different story. Having women in the industry versus having women in senior roles and representing management. So we'll discuss that a little bit later as well. And then eToro, which is a training platform, it did a similar study to see kind of how much, you know, what the women's statistics were. I think the first study was in 2018. Only about 8.5% of the women trading on the platform was women. And then in 2023, I think it was about 36% women-based. So it depends kind of what country or jurisdiction you're looking at. But it seems that Southeast Asia and developing countries and Africa as a continent has more representation for women in tech and crypto than some of the developed countries, which is very interesting. Um, being from South Africa myself, I truly understand that because you have to kind of follow your own path and, and work for where you want to be in those countries, you know. And um, we have a bit of a higher risk profile sometimes because of that, or risk tolerance. So we do tend to invest in higher risk investments compared to some of the other maybe more established countries. So those are just statistics that we kind of kind of came across. In terms of founders in the industry, it seems that the founders have actually decreased compared to how many there were previously, and that can also be contributed because there's just not so many women in higher um, you know, roles or senior roles as compared to the inter intermediate roles. And as Emily mentioned, and that's what I saw in going to conferences, a lot of marketing representation, female. HR, female. <laughs> you know, our brains work a little bit different. We have different strengths. It is, it's just facts sometimes, you know. Women are good at being HRs. Women are good at certain roles. It doesn't mean we can't do the other roles. We might just be naturally inclined or drawn to certain roles more than other roles. Um, that doesn't mean it's a negative thing at all. So I am also seeing the representation in certain areas being much more than other areas as well. Yeah, no, I think um, that sums up with what I've seen as well, obviously. <laughs> I'm not as niche as you, you both in the tech industry, but segueing into it recently as part of my practice, I have a client and I asked them in preparation for this, of their 500 plus staff, how many of them are women? And there were loads of women working there, but then it turned out when I dove a bit deeper that they were all in the HR space um, or they were in operations space or they were in the marketing space. And there were very few, um, if any at all, in the actual coding and um, IT infrastructure space um, for this web design company. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, okay, I just have one, one more initial question for, for both of you. What might be the causes then, and I know Emily, you've already started to touch on this, um, resulting in the underrepresentation of women in tech? Yeah, I think, in addition to access to the subjects that are offered in school, other contributing factors could potentially be parental influence. If you know neither of your parents are working in tech with young girls, they might be encouraged to seek other professions. They might not really consider tech to be a viable option for them. There are also the stereotypical gender roles as well. If there's no one in your network in tech, you will just look at other areas. I think they would probably be the key ones that I've noticed so far. Um, nothing else really comes to mind right now. So the reasons why, well, there's loads. I mean, how long do we have? It depends on what. Yeah. <laughs> it depends what time of your life, you know. Um, if we're talking about education, certainly there is not a balance necessarily, and how many women study the same thing as men necessarily. Um, and then imposter syndrome. We've spoken about this before in women in blockchain. Imposter syndrome is a big, big consideration here. We don't walk into a room and feel that we belong necessarily. We feel like we're imposing on a certain topic or situation or crowd. 
And that is something we can change internally and we can talk about and we can see how we can change our thinking and our way and our confidence to walk into a room and don't feel like we might not belong. Nobody belongs. <laughs> Everybody can be there, you know. And then just women putting their hands up. Women don't put their hands up, you know. Speaking on panels, it's amazing to have an all-female panel here. But women just don't put their hands up to do these type of things. So if we're talking about job applications, for instance, potentially a guy would apply for a job that he has one, he meets one criteria. Sometimes women feel that they need to meet all criteria to be able to apply for a job. That is not the case. I've been in a situation where that actually was not the case at all. I had some of the criteria. Somebody else necessar didn't necessarily have the criteria. There's certain things that's more important um, when people are looking who to place in companies um, than just meeting a set of criteria. You know, you have a chance. Just apply. Put yourself out there. Put your hand up. And I think it was um, one of our common allies here in, in um, came in as well that said she was talking to conference organizers and they um, were struggling to get women coders to do you know hackathons and things like that they were specifically trying to get women co coders to do it and um, they just didn't apply they didn't put their hand up it doesn't mean there's no women coders out there but we have to start representing and start competing no absolutely I think that you know, as a um, in a similar space, I try to encourage interns and trainees and junior lawyers at the law firm um, to put their hands up and self promote. It doesn't come naturally to I think Caymanians generally because of, I think certainly my experience growing up here, um, you're taught to put your head down, work hard, and you're going to be recognized for that. No, you're not because we have a lot of people from other um, countries who've moved here who are taught do something and tell everyone you've done it. <laughs> and when you have people who are looking at you versus someone else who's like, hey, I've done this thing, look at me, they're, they're no longer noticing what you're doing quietly in the background. And I think that that applies more so to women across all fields. Um, so I just encourage people to uh, you know, be proud of what they've done and let people know what they're doing. And don't think that that's something that you should be ashamed of doing. I know it's uncomfortable at first, but it's necessary to compete in the fields. Um, okay, I have a question for you, Emily. Um, can you share your journey into the tech recruitment space specifically and challenges um, to the extent that we haven't touched on them already that you see women facing versus men in the field for recruitment? Yeah, so I, as I said earlier, I started working in recruitment in 2018. I initially joined a small recruitment agency based in Australia. Um, it was kind of call center and when I came back to Ireland that same year I was looking at the different industries and I think tech was really kicking off then there was loads of opportunities in terms of jobs offered with the likes of Google Amazon um, and a lot of people were looking at educational courses as well so I thought it was a good market it seemed to be booming everywhere in Europe so there would be a lot of opportunities for me if I decided to move outside of Ireland um, I think you know, over the years, I've worked with both agency and internal. So one of the companies, they specialized in life sciences, data centers and and semiconductors. And the market in Ireland, it's, it's, it was quite niche. There wasn't a massive pool of candidates to choose from. So a lot of candidates were coming from other countries in Europe or further. Um, Ireland does have quite a lot of facilities and greenfield projects at the moment, which is great. But I worked there for a couple of years and then moved over to a global fintech company. And that's when I started to gain kind of exposure to other countries within Europe. Worked there for about two years and that's brought me to Stepping Stones where I've been for the last three months. and currently learning the Caribbean region right now. Excellent. Thank you. And what about you, um, Danielle? What was your segue into the tech industry? Because I think you were an admin before, weren't you? Yeah. And also, what was your motivation to found Women in Blockchain? 
Well, I was first in audit, so that was an obvious. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I think people understand why I wanted to leave audit. Sorry for the auditors out there. If you're not a born auditor, you're just never going to stay. Um, so I came to the island auditing, um, obviously, and that's where actually one of my friends, and that was back in 2017, taught me how to trade arbitrage on Bitcoin or blockchain exchanges. I started trading arbitrage at 3 a.m. in the morning, so doing audit season during the day, going to bed probably at 12, getting up at 3 because <laughs> that's when Kraken processed their um, fiat transactions. Their bank was in Japan. So that's when Japan, you know, the day kicked off and they processed their transactions and I could, you know, <laughs> I could, you know, do another cycle, make some money. I think at that point you can make up to, you know, 26% on one cycle. So that's really where I recognize the power of not necessarily cryptocurrency, but blockchain and what can change. And I realized that the industry is never going to be the same, you know, how things are built, how things work in the back end, not necessarily the front end. And that's where I decided to change my entire career. Um, I went into fund admin because that was the first opportunity I got in blockchain. <laughs> Actually went to Trident and Trust at that point. Um, they were onboarding loads of blockchain, or like cryptocurrency funds. It was very difficult at that point to get a bank account open to higher risk. Nobody wanted to take it on, couldn't get any bank accounts open. And then so I helped to three different fund admins help them set up their offering as well for specifically cryptocurrency, looked at KYC in depth, looked at policies and procedures, you know, valuation, all of that. And that is where I, for the first time, started working with Hash Directors. And then I came to Hash Directors about two and a half years ago and ever since been a director on these types of structures. Yeah. Well, thank you. I actually think I learned something new about you today. <laughs> um, Okay, over to Emily. Um, what qualities do you find most important in candidates when recruiting for tech positions? And how can candidates um, playing the field, sorry, and how can playing the field be balanced to promote more women being successful in their applications? Yeah, so I think, firstly, it goes without saying that candidates need to have the correct technical ability and skill set relevant to the roles that they're applying to. But I do think the importance of soft skills are massively underestimated at times. So if I'm looking at the top three skills, the first one that comes to mind is interpersonal skills. And there's been loads of times that hiring managers have chosen to hire the candidate who's a good communicator over someone who is maybe a little bit more skilled technically. And the reason being that in tech, it requires a lot of collaboration, working in cross-functional teams. And the role, the role may also have aspects of stakeholder management, presenting, reporting. So the ability to communicate as effectively is really important there. Some of the other skills I think worth mentioning would be problem solving. Um, you know, at times you might be dealing with different technology, implementing or integrating systems or even just troubleshooting issues. So you need to be able to think creatively and outside of the box to solve complex issues when they arise. The last one I would note is adaptability. Just with tech, there's constantly um, new advancements, you know, with the tools and technology. So individuals need to stay on top of that. They need to be eager and willing to upskill to keep up with the evolution of technology. There are loads of other skills, but they would be the top three that I've seen hiring managers most commonly assess throughout the interview process. Oh, thank you for that. And what about um, anything that you have observed that can be done to uh, even out or balance the playing field to promote more women being successful in their applications versus men? Yeah, so with that, as Danielle mentioned earlier, actually, it's funny that with women, they'll only apply for a position where they meet almost all of the requirements, whereas with men, it's if they meet 60 percent, they'll apply. So women are more selective with their job applications. I think employers need to be more aware of like the words and terminology used within job descriptions even some words like ninja guru rockstar they're associated with male dominated industries so to have more inclusive language and non-gender specific pronouns used within job descriptions will help to encourage more women to apply to those roles then there's other points as well like the interview process it's important to have an interview panel 
really shouldn't be made up entirely of men. There should be more than one round, ideally two or three stages, which are assessing different areas like cultural fit, technical ability, personality or online testing. It just helps to give employers a more rounded assessment of candidates. Um, in one of my previous companies, we actually had a recruitment process in place that meant an offer could only be extended to a candidate once minimum two candidates had been interviewed and one had to be female. So you might think that it would delay the recruitment process, but we actually found it to be really successful. And it did result in a lot more of female hires, which was great to see. Uh, those were some really great insights. And I hope that anyone that's in a sort of decision-making capacity or recruitment capacity here in the audience take notes and um, take it back to their teams to see how we can all improve. And I'm certainly gonna do the same for my team. Um, Danielle, uh, what are some of the key challenges that you've encountered in promoting this field amongst women? Yeah, I think we've discussed a couple of those issues. Yeah. <laughs> you know, women being basically themselves, not putting their hand up, keeping to themselves. We have to promote ourselves and we have to promote other women, basically. And that's why we have all these women events. That's why we talk about it to get a skill set and provide, like, develop a skill set and get some strategy to potentially change um, how things work. So a lot of the struggles basically is we're our own worst enemy. Um, we don't put ourselves up for these type of things. Absolutely do it. And then also, I just think women don't necessarily, I don't know, you all have been in circles of discussions around the table, you know, and you get to a social event and the women and the men split up and then the conversation changes, right? <laughs> and the men, sometimes you can hear them talk about investing, talk about sports, talking about all those things. And women tend to talk about other people. You know, we just speak <laughs> about different things. <laughs> so their interest is already just perked and there. Let's talk about investing in cryptocurrency. Let's talk about investing in tech, you know. Let's just start it. Um, a lot of women, they're scared to start doing these type of things. Join a training course in it, you know, just jump in. Um, and then we spoke about, you know, imposter syndrome as well. More than anything, I would just encourage everybody to take that leap. No, I agree. And I think that like the first time we met was over a coffee where I said, hey, I don't know anything about this, but I really want to know about it. Can you just help me get started? And and that's been sort of the, you know, the start of what I consider a great friendship now. And um, and that really sort of kick started me in the process, as well as Fiona, who I used to work with at Walkers, who I see in the crowd, who, uh, you know, generously sat down and talked me through everything that I needed to consider as well when I was first interested in this space and was finally at a, a firm, uh, I wasn't at Walker's, but I won't name the firm I was at, um, that would encourage me, you know, taking that interest and pushing it forward. So, you know, that was a me putting my hand up, reaching out and being vulnerable and saying, hey, I don't know anything. This is what a free search, but these are my questions. Can you help? And what I've found is that People are always willing to help, particularly in this space. And I've seen that with all of the women in blockchain events I've gone to, all of the Cayman Enterprise City, um, and particularly the Tech Talk events I've gone to. Um, so don't be shy. And I think we, I mean, we, we obviously had some questions for Hallie, who's not been able to make it. So I know there's a lot of sort of back and forth between the two of you without much time for a break, so apologies for that, which is why I'm doing a bit more talking. Uh, <laughs> but I think I, I, my other question for you, Emily, which I think you've already touched on, is how can companies be more inclusive in the recruitment process? So you just chatted about the, the interview process and recruitment standards. Is there anything else you had to add to that, or have we covered all bases there? Um, I think that was the main points I had on that. I do see that companies are putting more emphasis now on diversity and inclusion initiatives within companies. So we're seeing a lot more things like employee resource groups for women in tech or other underrepresented groups, which is great because it does build a sense of community and, and really benefits both the employer and the employees. Um, but yeah, no, I, I can't think of much else to comment on that. Thank you. Um, Danielle, and then I know you've touched on women in blockchain already, but 
obviously it's been such an integral part of the tech community here, um, the blockchain community here. What trends have you observed in participation at block, um, women in blockchain events over the years um, with respect to female involvement? Mm. So when we started, I think there was about 50 people at the first event. And that increased quite significantly. <laughs> I think our mailing list is probably about 200, 300 people now, which is phenomenal to see. And not only that, um, there's more participation. People are actually starting to do it and change their careers. I mean, I see Sarah there just changed her career recently. Um, there's a couple of different people, you know, that's really starting to specialize in it. So it's not only us talking about it, it is people are actually starting to change their career path and what they're talking about, what they're specializing in. So we've seen a massive increase in women in Cayman that's in the space, a massive increase in interest in it, um, the amount of people that invest in it. So it's good. I think the conversations are helping and we need to keep it going. So if anybody wants to be in a panel, let us know. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so I think the one thing we've observed and we can all agree is that a lot of times the reason why there's less involvement is because it starts at the very beginning, school. Now I know when I went to school we had IT, um, Mr. Rice who was there for like a longer <laughs> period than seems physically possible. His man was like, um, yeah, it's like he was immortal, but he was there forever teaching IT and that was it. You know, we learned how to master Microsoft Access, which I never used in adulthood. Um, Excel, which I still don't know how to use. And as a lawyer, Microsoft Word. <laughs> um, but what I see now that my daughter has coding and she has like these games and she's coding and she's like creating apps and she's in fourth grade. I'm like, wow, well, like, I don't know how to do any of this. And she's like, really? Uh, what do you think that access looks like across the islands? Because obviously that's just her school. Do we think all schools are, are offering these courses in their curriculum at a young age? And what can we do as an industry, either Cayman Enterprise City, um, women in blockchain, stepping stones to go into schools and encourage um, courses to be offered in this space and female participation at a younger age. Maybe I'll go to Emily first. Yeah, I think, well, one thing I've, I, I can't speak about Cayman Islands because I'm not too familiar with it just yet, but I know that in Ireland, there is a very distinct difference in the subjects that would be offered to an all male school versus an all female school. Um, when I was in school, we had a very, very basic computer course that we basically just learned how to type. And I know that a lot of kids nowadays, a lot of it is self-taught. Whereas when you look at the boys' schools, they have construction studies, computer software, engineering, and they're just not options for most girls. So I think really the responsibility is on schools to have more initiatives like field trips or sponsored talks, bring tech professionals into the schools to educate girls and boys about what sort of career opportunities that they could have. Um, even things like, what is it, transition year where you know students will go out to companies for a week or two and they'll do some on-the-job training. In one of my previous companies, we would bring students in. We had a very detailed program for them to follow for two weeks. And it gave them a much better idea if tech is something that they wanted to do long-term or if the alternative, it absolutely wasn't. So we found that it was very beneficial. Oh, thank you for that. Do you have anything to add, Daniel? Well, I don't know too much about the school <laughs> curriculum here, but I know... Cayman Enterprise City is doing quite a lot to involve students um, in the tech industry. So check in with Cayman Enterprise City for potential opportunities there. Well, I think Caitlin's grabbing the mic back from me at the end so she, oh, okay. she can chat to <laughs> those initiatives. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose, are there any examples of successful initiatives outside of what Cayman Enterprise City um, are doing in the tech space? that you're aware of? I suppose that's for you, Danielle, okay, because, I'll go. <laughs> because Emily's not on island yet. Yeah, so there's a lot you can do outside, and the internet has really taken over. I don't need to tell anybody that. There's so much content on just YouTube explaining the concepts of blockchain and building blocks of it to you in very, very fine detail. So just go and watch those videos. Um, there's an association called Shifi. They're doing an eight-week course for women 
takes you through basics of blockchain. What is a wallet? What is an NFT? What is a DAO? Everything you need to know to get the basic understanding of it. I would highly recommend you do that to get an understanding. There's loads you can do if you're interested in this field. Um, big opportunities in blockchain and tech is obviously coding. There's some great salaries for it as well. Just if you wanted to know, amazing salaries out there for it. So if you wanted to start doing that, I would recommend, you know, just learn how to code. Weirdly enough, there's a, there's a association, um, Tech Man here on Ireland as well. They do a women's coding course. I did the course uh, about three years ago. It's really JavaScript and like the basics of a website, which is not applicable necessarily to building a blockchain, but it gives you an idea of what coding is at least. You know, it gives you some of the building blocks. So there's loads of resources you can grab onto if you wanted to get involved in the industry. Oh, thanks for that. Um, and then I think I was, because Hallie's not here, I'm gonna throw one out to the crowd. Do we have any students or recent graduates who are willing to let us know any insights that they have for young women who are seeking um, studying or a career in tech based on their experiences? Tavia and I graduated from UCCI with a degree in computer science last year. And over my years, I know that there aren't that many women studying because of my five years, I was one of four in the entire program. And in the end, only two of us are still in tech. Wow. But I know that though not many of us stay in tech, we're still trying. You know, it's much better than when I was in high school, for example, where I'd be like one girl in a class of 30 boys studying IT. And here in came and there's a lot more initiatives than my movement really made up. And came into our city has been very helpful because my journey here in came and started when I did the woman called came and first cohort back in 2019, I remember when I did it. And from there I did networking, started an internship program in and came in first city. And from here I did to different companies over the years. And while I'm not working in tech right now, I'm working as a teacher. I'm still trying to encourage my students to branch out in tech instead of sticking to the stereotypical careers of like art and law. <laughs> Sorry, thanks. <laughs> I'm so glad you didn't say accounting and <laughs> Thank you for that, Sabia. I appreciate your insights from a young person's perspective because um, I don't consider myself young anymore. <laughs> okay, and then I just had one closing question. I mean, I think I could probably guess what you're both going to say, particularly you, Danielle, but if you were to give one advice based on everything you've said today, one piece of advice for people to take away, um, what advice would you give to women who are considering a career in tech? Back yourself. <laughs> That's it. Put your hand up. Just back yourself. Okay, and what about you, Emily? I think my advice would try to be or would be to try and find a community to join where you can meet like minded people, network, even looking at things like LinkedIn. There's a lot of communities there um, where you can find, you know, information sharing and networking. And it, it just gives you a better insights into the industry if you don't know anyone personally within the industry. Uh, thank you for that. Um, and I'll hand over to Caitlin. Yeah, thanks. But are there? Well, sorry, I didn't know if you wanted to speak first and then ask questions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I can say. Yeah. Yeah. So some of the programs that we have that were mentioned a few times through Enterprise Cayman, which is Cayman Enterprise City's nonprofit organization, we have a lot of tech training courses. So if you hop on the website, there's um, the Cisco Academy, the Oracle Academy, all sorts of workshops. There's cybersecurity, a cyber sandbox program that happens every other week. Um, there's lots of really cool things, and now that we're in our new facilities, we've got training rooms and event rooms and all sorts of cool spaces to do more things like this. So, again, put your hand up if you have an idea, would like to be on a panel or lead a panel, come see me and we'll have a chat. Um, but yeah, I think what we'll do is open it up for questions. Yeah. Um, this is more a, a different perspective from the question. Thank you for speaking to the panelists and to the enterprise city. Um, 
I know that we've been talking a lot about blockchain and coding. Um, I just want to offer a slightly different perspective in that, you know, we, we if you're in a more traditional industry, my experience um, in the legal industry is that the way my job looks now um, compared to how I would have imagined it 20 years ago is very different. And what I've experienced as a general counsel of myself ultimately is that by embracing the technology that your industry is innovating into, it's really valuable to organizations. Um, if you have an interest in tech generally or an innovation, um, it can really add up to your job satisfaction. It can, you know, be upskilling, it can be very valuable to hire. And not everyone in your organization is going to be willing to actually raise that. So I think that's also another alternative when you're thinking about technology as something really interesting and the energy of that. Um, it can also be something you can place as part of your as your industry and role. Um, separate or alternative to perhaps more to spread it into some of the things that you want to Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. On the screen, um, with respect to recruitment, so obviously, um, if a woman is looking at um, entertaining going down the uh, the IT path, um, one of the things that I found uh, in particular, because uh, of course, um, certifications and keeping up to date with technology. Um, obviously, uh, certifications that they have renewals actually some even six months, other ones one year. Um, having a recruiting background and in terms of the potential employers, how important is it now to have that four year computer um, degree or having these up to date certifications with respect to recruiting? And, and how does that set them apart? So, you know, I have 55 certifications and, and you know, my computer, my computer engineering degree. But at the end of the day, they look at my degree first to make sure. And then it's ticking off that box before they go down the, the rest of the path. So with respect to anyone who's considering going into EIT, it, do you say best practice recommendations is to get the certification? Or should they get the degree first? Or is the degree really that important? Did you get that, Emily? I did. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Um, yes, so it's a great question. It's I think there have been changes recently. It used to be that degree was the number one, um, whereas now employers do look for relevant experience over degree. A lot of the time it will specify that they are looking for educational requirements, but they will overlook it if the candidates have relevant experience. Now, I think one of the challenges that you would face without a degree is actually getting that first job because employers will look for entry level or students who have just completed a bachelor's degree for graduate opportunities, but you may find it challenging to get that role without the degree. So it's difficult to say. I mean, I, I do think that education, or sorry, experience is more important than education and it can be learned on the job, but both do hold importance. I've got a question. Sometimes small tweaks can really help, you know, like um, work, right? So being able to leave at four o'clock to pick up your kid from summer camp, or like in this new facility, we have a mother's room where mothers can nurse or pump if they need to. Uh, do you have any other ideas that businesses can do to make it easier for caregivers and women? Based on my experience, tech industry is the most flexible of all. The law firms are like the last to fall in that space of flexibility. Um, I think a lot of tech jobs are remote, but I might hand over to Emily for that because she might have better insights. Yeah, I think, again, that is changing, even in terms of the benefits that we're seeing companies offer. You know, it used to be your standard pension, healthcare, whereas now childcare assistance is being offered. Um, there's more flexibility for late starts or early finishes or even being able to work hybrid from home three, four days a week. A lot of jobs can be offered on a fully remote basis. You can be working for a company in a different country or continent. Um, so yeah, we, we are seeing a lot of flexibility within tech jobs right now. 
yeah, so I don't think that's as much of a hindrance to other um, fields that traditionally women go into in Cayman. In fact, that's actually a real big tip to head into the tech space. Mm-hmm. Are there any other questions? Everyone wants wine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Awesome. Let's give a big round of applause for speakers. Thanks again to our sponsors, and please do stick around for some networking and some beverages. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. Bye.